Even more payouts for JP Morgan, Blackstone is rich, and VCs are betting big on Bitcoin. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It's Thursday. I am Matt Kopenheffer. This year is David Hansen. David, we all know at this point that when Christmas rolls around, what you're really hoping for is a toaster oven. Is it a toaster oven or a toaster? Big difference. I have a toaster oven. You have a toaster oven. You need a toaster. Sometimes it's nice just to have the toaster. Just for toast. Yeah. What else is on your Christmas list? What is what is number two? A vacuum. <laughs> Whoa, I have no home just... appliances. <laughs> Do you want and socks and underwear too? Is I could it... use some, and I know we're going to get to our college student listeners later, but oh, it, I, I, but I, kids. I, I am hanging on to that. You don't want to grow up out there. All you get is toasters and vacuums for Christmas, so <laughs> stay young. <laughs> if you're David Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to the headlines. First headline of the day is from the Financial Times. We've got J.P. Morgan to pay two billion to set off to, to settle Madoff claims. Uh, this is uh, w- when is it going to end? When is it going to end for J.P. Morgan? J.P. Morgan allegedly neglected to alert regulators to the fact that they had concerns about Madoff and what he was doing. Um, this led to uh, th- this payoff. Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan are maintaining that J.P. Morgan didn't do anything mm-hmm. wrong, but they just want to get past this. Madoff actually predicted this. Back in 2011, this is from this uh, FT article. Uh, in 2011, Madoff said, J.P. Morgan doesn't have a chance in hell of not coming up with a big settlement. His words, not mine. Uh, and, uh, and from Jamie Dimon, this is, this is back to today. Uh, he says, we have to get some of these things behind us so we can do our job. Our job is to serve clients around the world. That's our job. So we want to get it behind us. Mm -hmm. Those sound like the words of just a frustrated, defeated chief executive officer. This is a very different Jamie Dimon than we saw just a couple years ago. Yeah, it's a, I guess it's a tentative two billion, right? Because the Financial Times said it was two billion. and I think the Wall Street Journal had a billion. More than a billion. More than a billion, so. And and, and just for for our listeners and and for you, David, too, uh, two billion. More than a billion. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so maybe not official yet. We saw how the thirteen billion dollar settlement that figure moved around a little bit. So maybe it's two. Uh, but yeah, I, I liked what Diamond said. He had some good points in terms of saying that's our job, and the opportunity cost to not settling is our employees will have to be questioned. There's court cases. There's lawyer fees. So there is a lot of cost going on to not settle. I liked how he wants to get back to business. I think it's the right move to do. Uh, to be fair, uh, part of their job is also monitoring what's going on with their clients and reporting things to regulators. So yes. that is part of their job too. Hopefully they do that better in the future. I in particular would like to see that as a shareholder myself. Right. Second headline. Second headline, going to the world of big private equity. Blackstone's Hilton joins ranks of biggest deal paydays. So this is referring to, of course, the hotel chain Hilton going public and at the IPO price, it was set to be the second biggest private equity profit generating deal. It is now the biggest. Uh, it, it, the, the, the shares had to trade up $2, so I think it is now the biggest profit of a private equity deal. Uh, my takeaway is I don't ever want to bet against Blacks. Boom. I That's mean, it's, the takeaway. Boom. it's just incredible what they've done, not just with Hilton, but what they did with Extended Stay when they sold it bought it back in bankruptcy, took it public again. I mean, these guys are just pretty incredible. And a lot of people are wondering, is their model of going out and buying single family homes, is that going to work? Is that a sustainable model? I'm not betting against Blackstone here. I mean, they've just shown time and time again that when it comes to real estate, they know what they're doing. This is where we need our sound machine to just hit that ching button. Yeah. Uh, it was an $8.5 billion profit at the offering price. Here's what. Here's one of my biggest takeaways from this. When people think about Blackstone, when investors think about Blackstone, I think, Steve Schwartzman is the guy who comes to mind. Makes sense, one of the founders of Blackstone. However, it was Jonathan Gray uh, on the real estate side who was behind this deal and most of Blackstone's big real estate deals. When investors think about Blackstone going forward, John Gray is a guy that they have to have in mind, and that's a guy that we really want to see stick around at Blackstone. And I say we, I'm a shareholder of Blackstone. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he's a very, very savvy real estate investor. And, and we should say they didn't completely offload Hilton. I think they st- their remaining stake is still 75% of the company. So it's not like they took this thing private and are now just completely getting rid of it. It's still going to be with them for a while. I don't know how long. 
they'll probably get rid of it. I mean, that's the business model. Yeah, but it's not 100% yet. Not 100% yet. <laughs> uh, third headline of the day, we're going to New York Times deal book. The headline, Venture Capital Bets Big on Bitcoin. David, your favorite topic. You are, I, I'm, I'm going to admit, I'm starting to be convinced just a little bit, but let's, <laughs> Coinbase, Coinbase, which is an exchange where you can exchange Bitcoin, among other things, getting $25 million in funding from a couple of VCs, uh, Anderson Horowitz, uh, among others. Um, David, you were telling me that you think that this is a, a really good deal for the VCs. You had an interesting reason why. Why is that? Well, a good deal, it's hard to say. We don't, it was a $25 million deal. We don't know the valuations, kind of where they're, they're valuing this company. But I think if you're going to invest in Bitcoin, it maybe makes more sense to invest in it in this indirect way rather than going out and buying $25 million worth of Bitcoin. They're putting $25 million into an exchange, like you said. So I think this, if Bitcoin becomes something big, these are the type of platforms that become kind of the, the Visa, the MasterCards of the world. These are the exchanges that Bitcoin could potentially run on. They allow merchants to accept Bitcoin. So they're offering a service that goes along with Bitcoin, but it's not exclusively Bitcoin. I mean, you can do other digital currencies through Coinbase as well, whether it be Litecoin or all these other digital currencies. So I think if there is a, a model that has some optionality in this digital currency world, it's probably one of these exchanges. And I'm, like you said, I'm not betting against these, these VCs. They have a pretty good track record of, of knowing uh, what the next innovation is. I'm not gonna bet against them, but whether it's Coinbase or Bitcoin itself, I think the whole, the whole theme is very VC oriented from the perspective that if Bitcoin succeeds, and, and succeeds just to the extent of becoming a small percentage, a very small percentage of global transactions, uh, the, the $1,000 per Bitcoin price today will look like a low price. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it'll have to be uh, because, and, and we've, we've kind of poked fun a little bit at the idea of, well, how do you figure out how much uh, a Bitcoin is worth? But Based on the programming, we essentially know how many Bitcoins will ever be in existence. And despite some of them will get lost and that sort of thing. Uh, and we know transaction volume worldwide. We know GDP worldwide, roughly speaking, at least. Um, so we can kind of say that if Bitcoin is successful at capturing a, even a sliver, a small sliver of the market, it would be. So it's sort of like I said, classic VC, you've got zero on the one hand. I think that there's a very real possibility that Bitcoin, five years from now, we're looking back and saying, ha, remember Bitcoin? Uh, on the other hand, the, the upside outcome is potentially a pretty big upside. All right, that's fair. You're, you're, smi you're smiling on the outside. I think you are celebrating on the inside that I'm finally... Well, I, I've said before on, on previous shows, it's going to take a lot of investment, a lot of technology and infrastructure and trust to even get it to a point where it could be any sliver of the transaction market in this maybe the first step. step along the way. Yeah. All right, moving to our focus for the day. The focus is Bank of America. Uh, you and I had found an article uh, last night on uh, Seeking Alpha. Usually uh, not about calling people out, uh, but it was an article titled Bank of America Should Trade Below Book Value. The thing that jumped out at me is that I think for the viewers and listeners of this show, uh, it may seem surprising to hear somebody say Bank of America should trade below book value because we're generally positive on it, me a little bit more than you, I guess. Um, but that's not, the, that's not a, a, a crazy perspective. Bank of America should trade below book value. That's not the out-of-the-box mm -hmm. thinking. That's more the market's thinking. And the reason we know that is because Bank of America is trading below book value. Um, but from my perspective, at least, I, I think this article missed some things, or, or at least I see, I see the situation for Bank of America differently uh, than, than, than the author did. Uh, so one of the things that I'll start off with, and then I'll, I'll let you, David, share a couple of your thoughts, is just the general idea where I think a lot of investors get into trouble is looking at the numbers today, looking at the results today, and essentially looking at that situation and saying, well, that's, pro that's going to continue out into the future. And so this is how I'm going to value it based on what's happening today. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that that's the easiest way to, to, to project out into the future. And so that's generally what the market is doing. So as investors, the only reason we're going to bother investing in individual stocks is we want to find situations where we're going to beat the rest of the market. 
Otherwise, we should just be investing in passive index funds. Uh, and so when you're, when you're looking at a situation where you are doing the exact same thing that the market is in, term, in projecting it out, you're not going to find those opportunities. And I think that's what's going on here, at least in part, with Bank of America. Yeah, and I think you're right in terms of the current performance is a heavy indicator of what it's going to be currently valued. If we think back to when Bank of America was trading at an even bigger discount to its book value at, what, a 60% discount maybe a year and a half ago? Mm -hmm. It's because a year and a half ago, the current performance was horrible. It was worse than it is today. So right. like you said, it's you can't take today's performance and say, okay, if they're only having a 6% return on equity, to, equity today, they're going to have that forever. I, I think that's a dangerous proposition. And even if it doesn't trade above book value, it's at, what, a 30% discount today. Mm -hmm. So in order for this to be potentially a successful investment, and for that multiple to move up, it can move up to a 10% discount, and that's still moving in the right direction for investors. So a couple other uh, uh, notable issues I, I thought. One thing that the author pointed out was how, how big of an impact the Volcker Rule is going to have in proprietary trading. If we look back to 2006, so this was before the crisis, long before the Volcker Rule, uh, trading account profits. Now, Bank of America, none of the banks were really breaking out true proprietary trading mm -hmm. because nobody was really thinking as much in those terms then. But trading account profits, as Bank of America termed it, was $3 billion. And that was a revenue line, mm -hmm. so $3 billion in revenue. And so when you think about, I mean, maybe that's a 50% margin business um, because you've got to pay, when, when you have proprietary traders, you got to pay those guys well, otherwise they're going to go off and set up their own hedge fund. Mm -hmm. So if we think about that as a 50% margin business, you're at about $1.5 billion in profits, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that's assuming that all of that is proprietary which trading. I'm which I'm almost 100% certain it is not. And you would have some insight into that, mm -hmm. right? Um, even at that level, about 7%, that's about 7% of 2006 profits. So what we're talking about is a very small portion of Bank of America's bottom line. Uh, in the another thing that the author notes is leverage, that Bank of America and the other banks were levered way high before the financial crisis, and that helped boost returns on equity, which in turn boosted valuations. The uh, problem is, is that today the leverage is at 9.2, about 9.2 to 1. Back before in 2006, so before the financial crisis, uh, Bank of America was levered at 11.7 to 1, so not that much right. higher. And the other thing to note there is that this isn't a good environment to be levered in. There's, there's not a lot of opportunity to lever up and do a lot of extra lending, and leverage is something that you can build fairly quickly. Obviously, the regulators are going to be you know, tightening down the screws much more on leverage right now than before but there's still room there for uh, Bank of America to expand that out. The last thing that I'll point out is that the, the author noted that 0.7% return on assets, which he said was roughly where Bank of America is now, um, was a new normal for banks, and then that, that should be expected going forward. Problem with that statement is that Wells Fargo is earning a 1.5% return on assets, and bank, uh, U.S. Bancorp is earning a 1.6% return on assets. So obviously 0.7% is not the new normal. And not to mention that all of this ignores the fact that Bank of America has legal settlements baked in there, has a lot of uh, extra overhead dealing with working down uh, souring mortgages and that sort of thing. All of that's going to come out over the next few years. That's going to boost returns on assets and everything else. Yeah, I agree. That's it? You agree? I agree. And like you said, don't want to call anyone out. I think there was, there was some very reasonable uh, deductions in, in this article as mm -hmm. well as, as thinking, okay, if it's trading below book value, why is that? Is because the returns aren't there. So I think that's a good thing to recognize. I just think some of the points in terms of why it won't get to a, a higher level of profitability may be a little off base. I, I, think it's, I think what it is, it's a good illustration of where the market's thinking is yes. right now. Because this is where the market is valuing Bank of America. And so this is a pretty good distillation of, of what the general market is thinking and why it has Bank of America uh, valued. Right and, now. and I think the market's probably stuck on that numbers because it's hard to project kind of what does the profitability look like in a couple years because it depends on a lot of things. It depends on them reducing expenses, depends on interest rates. So I think the market's saying, well, we don't know what two years looks like from now, so let's just base it on what we know today. Yep. Okay. Cool. Well, in, in, in terms of you agreeing with me, let's move on to emails. So we'll come to another place where now you will, uh, our mailbag, now you will agree with me. Our, mail, our email address is wtmi at fool.com. 
As I always say, we love getting emails. And the other day, you were skeptical about the idea that, actually it was just yesterday, you were skeptical about the idea that college students were listening to our show, and I invited them to email us at WTMI. An email they did. An email they did. We got a flood of emails from college students. This is one of my favorites. The, the headline was wrong, and, and Justin wrote, I am a grad student at the University of Nevada. That's it. Just straightforward. <laughs> Uh, there's another one that uh, the the title of the email was David was wrong, and uh, the the viewer wrote, "I was listening to yesterday's show and laughed at the idea that we students do not listen to you guys. Just so you know, my name is Tiago uh, Vidijal. I am an international student. I hope that I pronounced that correctly. I'm an international student from Sao Paulo, Brazil, studying business with an emphasis on investments at BYU Idaho, and I listened to your show and some others from the Motley Fool." Thanks for all of the tips about the investments and also about the internships. That's internships mm -hmm. here at The Motley Fool for college students. I am definitely applying. And also, thanks for the great show you guys put up. And Matt is always right. He didn't write that. He didn't write that. that, was that. But that is, that is also true. We also had one other. We had another uh, comment slash question. This one comes from Ben. Uh, ben wrote, first of all, David, I'm proving you wrong. I'm a daily listener <laughs> and in college. Ben also had a question. He's, he writes, I'm a senior and have a business idea to buy up real estate in a particularly depressed part of the country right now, but I am doubtful that any bank would lend to me despite the fact that I have a very specific business plan and have been endorsed, but not financially, by many professionals in the industry. Should I be hopeless? What, are, what other options do I have for raising cash to make my business a reality? Thoughts, Dave? Don't be hopeless. I wouldn't say that. Hopeless is a bad place to be. Um, it probably will be difficult uh, coming out of college to get a bank to lend to you to go buy depressed real estate um, that you don't have tenants for yet. I, I don't know if he wants to buy them and rent them out or that's kind of where he wants to just flip them. I think it's possible. I don't know how big his business plan, his vision is, but I would say start small if you can. You don't need to go after five properties. Maybe focus on one and try your hardest just to get Everything you have, put it in that, that one, try to get family to, to help you. I don't know, it, it's a tough thing, but I think it's great that he's thinking about that even in college. So, I don't know, I think it's gonna be tough, but I think he can do it, what do the, you say? The, the whole thing makes me think of that Warren Buffett quote, I'm a, I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman and I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. Uh, and, and this is certainly maybe a proving ground for Ben. Now. I can't give specific advice to Ben. That's not what we're about here. Mm -hmm. But if I put myself in Ben's shoes, I can think of two things that I might do. The first one would be to set up some sort of company uh, entity mm -hmm. uh, and raise money in sort of a friends and family round. I mean, he said that he's been endorsed by professionals in the industry. He noted not financially, but maybe there's a way to encourage them to, to contribute financially or maybe there's some friends and family Yep. Uh, I, that's what, who I'd reach out to. The other idea would be to take the whole thing in a different direction. So with, we were talking about Bitcoin earlier and the Coinbase thing. So Coinbase is an exchange that, can, uh, that, that enables Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and you were mentioning that one of the great things, you were mentioning to me that one of the great things about Coinbase is that it's not particular to, to Bitcoin being successful, but it uh, could be successful even if another digital currency. So it's kind of an enabling uh, sort of thing. So maybe there's an idea, a, a less capital intensive idea to go after this real estate opportunity that's more of an enabler than, than the actual purchaser itself. Um, so maybe that, that could go in a different creative direction. Yeah, I think that's a great point just to maybe set a company up, set your name up, whatever you need to do just to get the ball rolling. And, and a lot of the times when you think you have an idea, you don't end up doing that idea. The more you talk to people, like you said, maybe there's something else that, that kind of pops into his head and says, that's the route I should go. And, uh, and being constrained by the, the capital thing, I mean, that, that is tough. But on the other hand, just moving forward and getting the experience in business can be an invaluable, an invaluable lesson to learn. Yep. All right. Uh, our game for today, fool in the blank. Uh, this is where we have, I think we have two scenarios today, unless you snuck one in there that just I didn't two. know about. And uh, we have a blank in there. And yeah, we fool in the blank. Yes. We fill in the blank and whatever. All right, let's go to the first one. Uh, the first one is... Blank is the one stock I know I should sell, but I can't bring myself to do it. David, fool in that blank. I think I'm going to go with 
with Zillow, this is a stock that I have that's, that's done very well. And part of the kind of traditional value investor in me says, I've had my nice run. This is unsustainable. I have to revert to the mean here. It doesn't make sense at these valuations. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. I think a lot of people look at Zillow and say, that valuation's way far ahead of itself. But I can't bring myself to do it because where they are in the industry, uh, an industry leader, a first mover in this online real estate world. And we talked about the enabler platform in terms of what else could Zillow do. It's hard to put a value on that. What could they do in 10 years in terms of people buying and selling homes? Could everything be going through Zillow? Could everyone be selling a home through Zillow? I think it's possible and it's hard to put a value on that today. So part of me wants to sell it, lock those gains in, but I can't bring myself to do it because I have hope there. Tesco. That's yours? Tesco, the, the, not the, I think there's a U.S., I think it's an oil and gas or some kind of energy company, uh, but the, the overseas grocer, the U.K. grocer, uh, the reason I originally bought it was when I was living in Las Vegas, we did a lot of shopping at Fresh and Easy, which was a, the U.S. subsidiary, sort of a trial balloon for, for Tesco. Great operation. People loved Fresh and Easy. Problem was, Tesco started up in some bad geographies during a bad time, during the recession, and didn't really ever get it to scale. So it was a great concept and people loved it, but it just couldn't get, uh, Tesco just couldn't get it to work out. So I was, I was hopeful on Fresh and Easy in particular. That was my thesis that this would blow up and be a big uh, driver for, for Tesco. And they just couldn't get it to profitability and ended up selling it off. So now I have Tesco still sands fresh and easy and it's just sitting there and i'm like i should sell this but i just i haven't done it i have no excuse uh so on that note let's move on to the next one fair enough <laughs> if i could magically make one stock 30 percent cheaper it'd be blank david fool in that blank. this is the biggest no-brainer i've ever had in fool in the blank biggest no-brainer biggest no-brainer 30 percent haircut from the stock price today berkshire hathaway that would put the stock at a 5% discount to its book value. I think that's an absolute no-brainer with Warren Buffett at the helm. Even when Warren Buffett's not at the helm, a great collection of businesses that, are, that will continue to generate a lot of money. Still a lot of very smart people there. No-brainer, Berkshire Hathaway. I'll go Visa. I'll go Visa because if we, had, if we had done a fool in the blank that was the opposite of our first one here, what is one stock that I haven't bought uh, that's not in my portfolio and I, and I should buy, mm -hmm. Visa would be right up there on the list. If Visa was suddenly 30% cheaper, I would have very little excuse not to buy it. All right. Let's hope for some big market crashes. Yeah, market crash. That would be <laughs> fun, wouldn't it? Uh, let's finish off on the Twitter sphere. Uh, David, what's our first tweet? Our first and last tweet. Is from, Jordan, one tweet. is from Jordan Wathen at JWTHN. He says, sometimes I wonder if real estate agents are in the business of selling homes or just putting their pictures everywhere. Huh. Interesting. Do you know any real estate agents? I do. Do they I have want. their picture everywhere? No, not everywhere. But, but a lot of, it's a very, it's a very promotional business and it's, it's a tough business to be in because there are so many real estate agents. So marketing yourself and getting your name and your brand and your face and your picture out there, it's important. On success. the top of toilet seats when you put it up. Wait, is that, that's, right that's where you would put yours. That's where I would. You know, people are going there every day. They're going to see you. Oh, you're talking about private homes, toilet seats and private homes. You'd be Everywhere, going door to door. Yeah, yeah. You'd be breaking and entering. Yeah, breaking, breaking and, and entering, entering, slapping my sticker on their <laughs> toilet. That's legal, right? That's, that totally makes sense. I would have like the realtor key. I could get in. Our Twitter address is at TMF Financials. We're obviously hurting for tweets here. So tweet <laughs> us at TMF Financials. Uh, we could potentially answer a question or, or put up your wisdom on this show. Uh, read it out loud. Or tell us where you think would be the best place to put your face as a real estate. Oh, yeah, definitely. Most creative place. That, that could be on Twitter or email us, WTMI at fool.com. And on that note, David's face on your toilet seat. We will end the show. <laughs> That's all we have for today. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. We will see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about. And The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.